Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're so pleased to have you with us tonight. I'm going to wait one more minute before we start to make sure that everyone's on. Um, we have a couple of members joining us from our pre-event, so I want to give them a chance to log in. Um, but my name is Sarah Moore. I'm the Director of Development for, for Middlesex Health, and I also lead the Women's Wellness Fund. And we are so excited to be in uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month and to be hearing from uh, one of our own experts, Dr. Andrea Malon, tonight in her talk, Everything You Need to Know About Breast Cancer. Um, I want to start by thanking our sponsors, um, Sally Meyer, the Peach Pit Foundation, A.R. Mazada, and Essex Savings Bank. Um, let me change this view here. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, and then I want to share with you what the Women's Wellness Fund is all about. Um, this is our 12th event. Um, there we go. And um, the mission of our work is to advocate for, educate about, and fund priority women's health projects in our community. Um, and our members help us do that. Um, so I want to also acknowledge our steering committee, which helps us uh, set the direction for the year and helps us figure out which topics we're going to present. Um, so this is the mighty group here. Thank you to them. Um, I also want to thank our members, um, many of whom are on the, the meeting tonight. Um, their membership dollars help us fund these very important projects. Um, together over the last four years, uh, they've donated $175,000. Um, this year, we're funding four projects. Um, we are screening uh, women who may be at higher risk for cancer at their mammogram appointment. Uh, we are funding uh, a project uh, to expand our offerings in the uh, area of integrative medicine. Um, and we, that project, unfortunately, is on hold because it's construction and it's considered non-essential. So we have to wait until we see the end of uh, the COVID <laughs> pandemic before we can get back started with that. But we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, and uh, we are also funding a genetic testing study. Um, which is helping to find genetic mutations that might not have been caught otherwise with current guidelines. And then finally, for the fourth time um, in a row, we're funding the Perinatal Social Work Program, um, which helps pregnant moms who are really facing challenging times and circumstances find the help that they need. Um, so uh, one bit of housekeeping before we get started and introduce our speaker. Um, if you do want to ask a question tonight, um, we're asking you to use the Q&A feature, and we will be um, trying to get to as many questions as we possibly can, because we figured um, there will be quite a lot. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask Laura Martino, um, who's our Vice President at Middlesex Health, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Sarah. It's nice to have everybody listening in tonight, even though we're, uh, we're apart. It's nice to have all of you here. Um, it's an honor for me to introduce Dr. Andrea Malon. Um, Dr. Malon has served our community as a general surgeon and a uh, specialty practice breast surgeon for many, many years. Um, I would say that probably one out of two people in the community know who Dr. Malon is, and that's a good thing because she's been a wonderful asset to Middlesex Health. Um, Dr. Malon also serves as our medical director of the Middlesex Health Cancer Center and has dedicated her career to improving the care and treatment of all cancer patients, including those uh, with breast cancer. Um, I, I thought a nice uh, way to introduce uh, Dr. Malon is to give you a sense as to what her patients um, say about her and the, an idea of the impact that she's had on them. So this was someone who wrote in to us and said, Dr. Malon is loved and admired by me and my entire family. So far, I am cancer free. We are blessed to have such a wonderful and dedicated surgeon. Dr. Malon is a square shooter with, with compassion. She saves lives and what more can be said about someone. And one more, I remember the first visit with Dr. Malon. She made me feel so important, like I was the only breast cancer victim. Dr. Malon drew pictures of what needed to be done and what test results would show, all of which were uh, helped me absorb the information when I got home by reviewing her notes and seeing what she drew. I appreciate all the time that she gave me with answering questions, giving advice, showing concern for my emotions. I love you, Dr. Malon. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrea Malon.
Thanks, Laura. I'm gonna get things organized here. Um, <clears throat> obviously, this is a very different presentation. Uh, I've not really presented in this fashion before, uh, not having any idea if people are listening to me or falling asleep or understanding what I'm saying. So I'm going to do my best and uh, again, use the chat or Q&A function to uh, reach out to us if you need to. Um, <clears throat> I guess if I just push the follow button, great, perfect. <clears throat> so um, I have a bit of a daunting task. I'm going to try to, in less than an hour, give everybody some basic information about breast cancer, what it is, who it affects, how it affects them, and what we're going to, how we treat it basically. And some of you I know uh, are patients of mine, of course, so you've heard some of this before. Um, I'm not gonna call on people to come up here and tell everybody what they know or learned. Um, but we'll give it a try. So who can get breast cancer? Anyone. So I tell my patients, women have breasts, uh, men have breasts, but women, of course, have more breast tissue than men. So breast cancer is the most common cancer in women, um, but since men have breasts, they can also get breast cancer. The median age of diagnosis, so again, median, half, half people are diagnosed under that age, half over, is 62 years old. And that data comes from about 2012, 2016, which is so um, this data is from the American Cancer Society, estimated cases, it's always hard to tell, but this is for the United States. Diagnosed, we have about 268, 267, 269,000 women and um, just under uh, 3,000 men diagnosed. And you can see the death rate right there, 41,760 women, 500 men in the United States. So those are the American Cancer Society estimates for 2019. Breast cancer is the most common cancer in women globally, regardless of their race or ethnicity. So anybody can get it. Again, the most common cancer in women. And the average lifetime risk is about 13%, which is one in eight. And if you know anything about statistics, that would be if every woman lives until age 90, let's say, because different studies may use high 80s or low 90s for their cutoff. So the one in eight is if everybody lived that long. The highest incidence overall is in white women. However, for younger women, women diagnosed under the age of 40, the highest incidence is in black women. And you see the number right there for the women. So what about the incidence? What has happened over the past years? So in the 1980s and 1990s, if you look at data, you'll actually see that there are increased rates. And the increased rates are because we developed screening mammography. So prior to the 1970s and 80s, we did not have a lot of mammography going on. So women were not diagnosed at early stage cancer, which means some people might have passed away from other problems prior to their diagnosis being known, or it may mean some women died of breast cancer and nobody even knew that. Everybody knows some older relative or somebody in the family who people talk about and they died of quote unquote natural causes. What does that mean? Who knows? It could have been breast cancer. So we had increased rates in the 80s and 90s because we started doing mammography, and the more you look for it, the more you will find it and diagnose it. And what you see on the next line are the actual mammography rates. So in 1987, it's estimated about 29% of the population in this country were getting mammograms, and by 2000, we had that number up to 70%. 1990s into 2000s, people had been getting hormone replacement therapy. So post-menopausal, after the age where women would have a natural menopause, postmenopausal combined estrogen and progesterone hormone replacement therapy had been used. People thought it was good for the patients in a lot of ways, but it was found out eventually that this did increase the rate of breast cancer in those women. Over time, we've had a gradually increasing rate in recent time, and we think this has something to do about body mass index, and the decline in the average number of births in this country. And we'll get into that in a moment when we talk about the risk for breast cancer. So what about dying? What is the death rate for these patients, for patients with breast cancer? The lifetime risk of dying is about 3%. So we talked about 13% risk of getting it, but a lifetime risk of dying from it is about 3%. That's one in 39 women. Breast cancer is the most common cause of death from cancer amongst Hispanic women in the most recent data. And a lot of this, again, comes from the American Cancer Society. It's the second most common cause of death from cancer in the other populations. So the population groups that I've chosen here on the next line are not mine. This is how the American Cancer Society has been capturing data over the past years. 
for those other women, lung cancer generally is the most common cause of death. So this may have to do with rates of smoking amongst the Hispanic population, in terms of women at least, rates of smoking being maybe perhaps a little lower, and therefore breast cancer rises to their higher cause of death. If you look at the death rate for breast cancer patients and divide that up by the different groups, the death rate is highest in black women, and you see the rate there. Um, and the reason for this, and we can talk about this or think about this a little bit later on when we talk about the reasons why people get breast cancer and when we talk about the different types of breast cancer. So it's proposed that the reason why the death rate is highest in black women is multifactorial. It has to do with the cell subtype of the cancers and perhaps the time at which they're diagnosed. Perhaps they're not being diagnosed at an earlier stage, which really helps decrease death rate. So what about the death rate? What's gone on with that over the past years? So earlier detection, improved treatment has led to a decline in death rate. And in the 1970s into up to 1990, there was a fairly significant decrease. And then even more so, 1990s up until recent time, a rapid decline. Over the last few years, we've seen a slowing in the death rate. And that probably has to do with the fact that we have reached a point where a lot of women are being diagnosed earlier, we've reached a point where we have some really good treatments. And unfortunately, and you'll see this as we talk about some risk factors going on, unfortunately, some people have cancers that current treatment techniques do not help. So, And then you see survival rate by ethnicity broken down here. And definitely survival rate is higher in black women than white women. They haven't put the other groups in this but just to give our two largest groups of the various ethnicities that are followed. And you see the death rate has declined for both white and black women, but we've done better for white women all along. So what are the survival rates? So survival rate in general, and again, you can tweak data in a million ways if you know anything about data. Um, so this is very general data, sort of looking at a variety of sources, taking into account a variety of types of breast cancer in general, Overall survival is 91% at five years, 84% at 10 years, and 80% at 15 years. So that's pretty good. So what influences survival? We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But as people who have met me as patients know, I like to talk about what is cancer? Because it occurred to me as I went, after my training, as I started treating patients, it occurred to me that there was a bit of a discordance between what providers were talking about and patients were understanding because patients not have not necessarily studied cell biology. So it's important that I have people understand what that word cancer means because that helps them to understand why we're recommending what we're recommending. So cancer is a disease of abnormal cells. Cells, and again, many people may know this, but not everybody, so I'll just put it out there. Cells can only be seen with a microscope. They are, as I say, microscopically small. So mammograms, ultrasounds, MRIs, these tests do not see individual cells, but our entire body is made of individual cells. And these cells are, as I say, the Legos of the human body. Again, microscopically small, but they make us who we are. And our cells all have a function or a job to do. So the disease of cancer means that at some point an abnormal cell was born, if you would, and it grows in an uncontrolled fashion. So instead of doing what it's supposed to do, whatever job it was supposed to have, and then dying off at a certain point, it just keeps making more and more and more clones of itself. So why is cancer a problem? Cancer can cause a problem where it starts growing. So let's forget breast cancer for a second and say if the cancer starts in my brain, then I have a problem because it's taking over the space and function of my brain. But critically, cancer can also cause problems if it spreads to vital organs. So when we have a cancer, breast cancer or others, we have to say, is this cancer capable or not of spreading to other organs? And we call this property invasion. So some breast cancers, have the ability to spread and some do not. And we divide breast cancer into invasive or not invasive. The majority of breast cancers, even the ones we cure, are indeed invasive cancer. So when people see their pathology report and they see that word invasive, they think, oh, this is horrible. And the reality is 
that most breast cancers are indeed invasive, and it's only a smaller proportion, perhaps 20%, that are not invasive. So how does cancer happen? Why do these abnormal cells occur? Why do these cancers start to glow? We actually think that cancer in general, breast and others, is actually a problem that's fairly common in humans, probably a lot of other animals, because all of the time that we're alive, we have cells die off and new cells are born. And anytime a new cell is born, that cell has the potential for being abnormal and being cancer. So why do some people end up with a cancer? Why do they have these mutations or abnormalities occur? There's different reasons, and we don't fully understand all of this as of now. So changes in a cell are called a mutation. And some people get these mutations because they inherited a risk, and some people do not. So inherited cancers, meaning the predisposition to getting cancer that's inherited is called genetic but the majority of breast cancer is not genetic. So we'll talk about genetics first and then non-genetic reasons. Because again, those are the majority of people. So genetics lessons. Humans have two sets of genes. We inherit one from our mother, one from our father biologically. Doesn't matter, male, female, wherever you came from, however you were created, you get one set from the maternal side, one set from the paternal side. There are many, many, many pairs of DNA on our genes. And the genes are essentially the instructions for the human body. They will dictate our height and our hair color and a whole variety of things. DNA was first sequenced in 2000, so that's like a fraction of time when you think about humans and how long we've been around. And people take DNA evaluations for granted. And the reality is we only sequenced DNA 20 years ago. That's a flash of an eye in, the term, in terms of human beings. And differences within the DNA can put people at risk for certain diseases. So I can inherit either from my mother or from my father a predisposition for diseases, anything from cancer to multiple sclerosis to Alzheimer's to a wide variety of things. Again, inherited from mother or father, increased chance, and there are many different. It is believed, as best as we know as of now, that most breast cancers occur for reasons that are not related to our DNA, that are not genetic. Now we're learning more about DNA and genes all the time. So a lot of patients and family and lay people have heard about the BRCA genes, BRCA. Everybody knows about those because they were the first DNA abnormalities found to be associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. The reality is now when we do genetic testing, we test as many as 84 different areas of the DNA to look for genetic abnormalities. But even with that, we estimate that only about 20% of breast cancer is related to inherited problems from mother or father. Now, we might learn more in the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years, but that's where it stands now. And that number, 20%, has not changed a great amount in the last few years. So what about non-inherited? What about everybody else? If 20% of people are getting cancer because they inherited that risk from mother or father, what about the 80%? So who has an increased chance of getting breast cancer? Well, certainly women. Men and women both are born as babies, infants, male, female, with small breast buds. So there's tissue there that's the precursor to the breast. And during puberty, as it normally naturally occurs, the female's breast enlarges and changes. And because of the changes that occur hormonally in women, they are at a higher risk than men. Increasing age. So people say, oh, I didn't think I could get it at 50 or 60 or 70 or 80. This is not true. I showed you the data before. 62 is the median age at diagnosis. That means half the women are under, diagnosed under that and half the women over that. But the reality is as long as you're alive, you can get cancer. You're never at zero risk for that cancer. So increasing age, the longer you're alive, the higher the chance that an abnormal cell, remember these cells are changing, and an abnormal cell is born, and there we have it. Estrogen window. So we know estrogen plays a big role in breast cancer. So the estrogen window has to do with things such as how old or young was the woman when she started to get her periods, and how old was she when they stopped. So that's estrogen window. The estrogen window is interrupted when women have pregnancy. So then if somebody never had children versus started having children at a younger age, it changes their risk level. Hormone pills after menopause, I touched on that briefly before. So this is women after a menopausal age. 
This is not a woman who's 30 years old who had a hysterectomy and we're giving her that which we took away. This is women over age 50 who are getting combined estrogen and progesterone. There is an increased risk of getting breast cancer. Obesity, we know that fat cells have the ability to store estrogen. So body mass index definitely plays a role in breast cancer risk. Physical inactivity, and these are things that come up even independently. So physical inactivity comes up, alcohol use, certain sites, types of cell changes seen on prior breast biopsy. So some women might have had previous breast biopsies, and if they show cell changes called atypia, that means they're at a higher chance of getting breast cancer. Dense breast, and again, we could spend the whole night talking about breast density. About 40 to 50% of women have dense breasts. Some of those, about eight or 10% of women have what's called extremely dense breasts. Those women are definitely at a higher risk for breast cancer. Chest radiation, this is not just somebody getting a chest X-ray or a CAT scan, but women who had radiation to treat other cancers. In particular, women who had radiation to the chest to treat Hodgkin's lymphoma in the past have a much higher risk of breast cancer. Use of DES that was used in pregnant women years ago, this does not seem to be a risk factor for the children who were born when the mom used DES, but for the mom. So that generation is sort of moving outward. You know, I think. And tobacco use does come across as an increased risk for breast cancer. The data right now, and again, data does change, so not increased, <clears throat> separate from body mass index. In, so separate from body mass index, dietary fat consumption alone has not proven in independent studies to be an increased risk. As I said, the offspring of mothers who took DES, some fertility drugs that people use are concerned. Clomid is a little bit questionable, but most of the others do not appear to be associated with an increased risk. Breastfeeding is actually protective, meaning there's a decreased rate. There have been no studies showing that environmental pollutants, pesticides have had any impact on breast cancer, except perhaps exposure to DDT while the person was in utero. So not the woman who got exposed, but if she was pregnant, her fetus. Um, abortions, the higher number of those does seem to somehow change things hormonally. Uh, does not, sorry, does not change things hormonally and does not lead to an increased risk. People ask me all the time about different types of bras, underwires, deodorants, breast implants. None of these have been associated with an increased risk of breast cancer in evidence-based studies. There's a little bit of mixed data on some other things. So patients ask a lot about soy. Soy looks somewhat similar to estrogen in the body, which is why everybody's always saying uh, estrogen, breast cancer, soy. Um, what we see is for Asian women, there's an inverse relationship, but that does not hold true for other women. So it's a little bit of mixed data. So with a lot, as with a lot of other things, caution is there. Fruit and vegetable consumption, I put may reduce risk because the studies are a little bit up and down, but they're obviously healthy for us in so many other ways. Go ahead and eat your fruit and vegetables. Oral contraceptives, uh, if you've used it currently or recently, there's perhaps a small increase but if women used oral contraceptives and they're 10 years out from when they used it, there's no difference in breast cancer rates. And there's limited data from, for newer ultra low dose oral contraceptives. IUDs, some of them, some of the IUDs have different hormones in them. And one of them is perhaps increased, another injected progesterone. These may be associated with changes. I put question marks because the data on that is not really clear. But how do we find breast cancer? So if a woman is going for a regular checkup, seeing her docs or gynecologist or primary care or breast surgeon, the vast majority of breast cancers are found as small abnormalities on a mammogram or ultrasound before they are large enough to cause symptoms. Meaning the patient doesn't feel them, the surgeon doesn't feel them, they usually do not cause any symptoms, they're just something we see on the breast imaging. However, if people are not going for their imaging, if they're not getting their mammograms, and their regular breast exams. Or occasionally, there are women unfortunate enough to have rapidly growing cancers. This is a very small percent. Occasionally, we can see symptoms even if people are going for mammograms. So the most common symptom is a mass, a lump, a bump, a nodule, whatever term you'd like to use, something that somebody can feel in the breast. 
drainage from the nipple is concerning to us, particularly if it has blood in it and it's coming out by itself from one breast. So drainage that comes out just because people are checking, meaning squeezing the nipple and it doesn't have blood is not significant. Color change or redness in the breast that persists might be a sign of aggressive breast cancer. The vast majority of people who get some color change in the skin of the breast have an infection. Anything that gets better by itself, redness comes, redness goes, that is not cancer. Because again, cancer is abnormal cell overgrowth. So if it creates a symptom, that symptom is not going to get better by itself. New nipple inversion, lots of women have nipple inversion they've had chronically or their whole life. New nipple inversion might be a sign of cancer, but very frequently I see it and it happens and nobody knows why and there's no cancer associated with it. But if somebody has a nipple that was always everted, meaning sticking out, and then all of a sudden is inverted, sticking in, they should definitely have that evaluated. And sometimes people can have a non-invasive, means it can't travel, type of cancer that starts near the nipple and it shows up as some changes, almost like an eczema right on the areola or nipple. These are not common though, these are occasional. All right, so what about the stage? How do we think about breast cancer? How do we think about curability and what we do? So the stage is a way to help us understand the extent of cancer. And the stage is used for treatment planning, and it's also used to help think about how serious this is and what are the odds of curing the cancer, which means prognosis. The stage will estimate the amount of cancer in the breast and the rest of the body. So we want to look at the area of cancer in the breast, that's called the tumor area. We want to look at lymph nodes, I'll talk about that in a moment, and spread to other area, which is called metastases. So medical folks for many years, for many cancers, we call, talk about the PNM staging system, tumor nodes metastases. For breast cancer, the stage for the last two or three years actually also includes things called prognostic factors. So prognostic factors are specific features of individual cells that help us understand how aggressive the cells are. So here's my sidebar. If cancer, cancer cells are an invading army into our body, our country, and we wanna protect it, we need to know a couple things. We need to know where the invading army folks are, where all the soldiers are. So what's going on in the breast, what's going on in the nodes and the rest of the body. And we also want to know how aggressive each individual soldier is. And that's what prognostic factors are. So now you're saying if you take the cells, separate from how many of them are in the breast and how many are in the nodes, if you take the individual cells and look at them microscopically, do they appear aggressive or not? For breast cancer, stages are zero up to four. Stage zero is easy. Those are the non-invasive breast cancer, meaning they cannot spread. And there are differences, slight differences in cell type and how we treat them, of course, but stage for non-invasive is always the same as zero. Uh, before we get into the other stage, quick sip of water. Before we get into the rest of the staging for the invasive cancers, quick word about the metric system. Um, people see their pathology reports and people will be seeing a lot more reports in the future. Uh, we use the metric system. Why do we use the metric system? Because pretty much the rest of the world with the exception of the United States and two or three other countries uses the metric system. And medically, we all share data across the world. So the metric system is what we need to use. So 2.4 centimeters is an inch, but there are 10 millimeters in each centimeter. So therefore, while 2.4 centimeters is an inch, 24 millimeters is also an inch. And I'll point that out as we go along. So for invasive breast cancers, first we have to say, what is the size of the area in the, in the breast itself? So tumor one is small, tumor two, medium, tumor three, large, and tumor four, extra large. And tumor one is anything up to two centimeters, so just under an inch. Tumor two is give or take an inch to two inches. Tumor three is over two inches. And tumor four is any size that's invading into the muscle, which is right behind the breast, or the skin, which is right in front of the breast. The next part of the stage has to do with lymph nodes. So we need to think for a moment and just define what lymph nodes are. We have a lymph system throughout our entire body. Think of blood vessels, but lymph vessels are much smaller. They're microscopic. You don't see them when you operate on people. They're sort of our scavenger system in our body. So fluids, 
bacteria, viruses, all sorts of things that are in our body can get into our lymph vessels. And as fluid travels through our lymph vessels, it passes through lymph nodes. So think of filters. So we want to know if someone has invasive cancer, did the cells get into the lymph vessels in the breast? And the lymph vessels in the breast are pretty much going to the armpit where there are lymph nodes acting as filters. And we want to know, are these cells in the nodes or not? <clears throat> So for node involvement, we have N0, that means there's no cancer that we can see in the nodes, N1 for one, two, or three nodes, N2 for up to nine nodes, and N3, which is more than 10 nodes, or lymph nodes that are not in the armpit, because breast cancer can spread to lymph nodes above the collarbone, or in the neck, or inside the chest. And the final part of the stage for invasive cancer is, have these cancer cells spread to other parts of the body? The most common areas that can occur are liver, lungs, bones, and brain, and that will be the M category. So either yes or no, they have. Now, remember I said, we look at not only the number of cells, breast, how big is the area, nodes, other areas, but now we want to look at those individual cells, and I'm not going to make you learn these entire slides down below here, but I put these two diagrams just to demonstrate that cells are very, very complex things. And they have all sorts of characteristics and things going on inside and outside and receptors on the edge. And so prognostic factors are ways of looking at the individual cells and defining as compared to all the other breast cancers, are these cells more or less aggressive or basically the same? So for breast cancer, the primary prognostic factors we look at are the following. Nuclear grade is just looking at the cell nucleus and again, I could spend a lecture just talking about this. If you want to research it, go ahead. This is what the pathologists do all day. They look into the microscope and they look at the cell nucleus and based upon different components, they assign grades one or two or three. Grade two is average. Grade one means they look less aggressive. Grade three means they appear more aggressive. Hormone receptors. Receptors are places on the outside of the cell where something can attach to the cell and influence its activity. So for breast cancer, it's important to know whether the cancer cells, yes or no, do or do not, have receptors for the hormones estrogen and progesterone. And this is independent of whether the person has their ovaries in, their ovaries out, premenopausal, postmenopausal. Humans all have estrogen, even men have estrogen in their body. So we're not saying how much estrogen does the person have. That's not what we're asking. We're asking, do the cells have receptors? And why are we asking that? Because it helps us understand how aggressive the cells are. And estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors are good things to have on the cells because those cancers are less aggressive. The next one is called HER2, more formally known as HER2 new. It's the same thing. It's a little protein that either is or isn't hanging out on the edge of the cell. And in general, we want the cells to be HER2 new negative but I'll get to a slight variation in a minute. The other thing that we sometimes use, not in every case, so the above, the above prognostic factors are done routinely on all breast cancers that are invasive. The grade, hormone receptors, HER2 new. Genomic testing is a way to look at multiple other parts of the cells. Up to 23 different parts of the cells are evaluated. It's all a computer algorithm. And based upon data that's been collected and seeing how people do in terms of cure and not, the computers will then spit out a score that's called an oncotype score, oncotype score or mammoprint score. The most commonly used one is oncotype score. So genomic testing is a way of drilling down even further into the cells to say how aggressive are these cells. There are some other scores that we use, and these other scores are not routinely used, so I'm not going to talk about them. People may get pathology reports from other institutions where they're looking at some other things. A lot of that is just data gathering because these are the prognostic factors that are used in this day and age. We're not going into this. <clears throat> the next several slides I put just to show everybody how complex the actual staging is. So I'm going to just go through these, but you see in the first column it gives the TNM, tumor size, status of the nodes, then it combines it with the nuclear grade. Then it combines it with the status of the HER2 nu, the estrogen receptors, the progesterone receptors to finally get the stage. So this first slide are the smaller cancers. Tumor size is zero or one, and now we start getting into slightly larger cancers. 
Now we start getting into cancers with positive lymph nodes and so on and so forth. So these slides are really just to give everybody an idea of how complex the cancer staging has become. This is the final slide for staging. This is anybody who has evidence of cancer spread to other parts of the body are stage four. So in general, if we just wanna think about it in an easy fashion, stage one typically are small tumors with either no lymph nodes involved or minimum nodes involved. Stage two would be medium-sized tumors or maybe small tumors with a few more nodes. Stage three, large tumors, multiple nodes, and stage four are those that have spread outside of the breast and lymph node area. So how is survival impacted? Well, critically, stage of diagnosis is definitely one of the most important factors. So if we break up those survival rates by the stage of diagnosis, for patients who have disease noted only in the breast, five-year survival rates are 99%. For people who have regional disease, meaning lymph nodes in addition to the breast, 86%, and 27% five-year survival rate for those patients who have evidence of it spread to outside of the breast and node area. And you can break these up even further by prognostic factors and exact size, but these are sort of general rates. But these are general rates if people get treated. They're not general rates if they just walk out the door and get the treatment. So we can also break up survival by looking at the different prognostic factors, right? Because we said that's really important too. So if patients can't have cancers that have estrogen and progesterone receptors, sidebar, most people either have both estrogen and progesterone receptors positive or both negative. So there are some where it's mixed, but just for purposes here, let's say if your estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors are positive and your HER2 nu is negative, that is the best type to have, five-year survival rates overall 92%. And then you see the different ones with the worst prognostic be prognosis being in those patients who have what are called triple negative. That means those cancer cells do not have receptors for estrogen or progesterone, and they do not carry the HER2 new marker. All right, so let's talk about treatment now. So there's two aspects to treating cancer, particularly invasive. We need to think about how do we treat the area where the cancer started, meaning the breast region, the nodes, that we call that the local treatment. So think of your local neighborhood. And the modalities or types of treatment we use for the local neighborhood are surgery and radiation. So radiation is x-ray treatment given just to a particular part of the body. But if everybody, if somebody has invasive cancer, we also need to think about, do we need to treat the rest of the body? Because if we're only treating the local area, the breast and the nose, and cancer cells have already escaped, and are circulating in our bloodstream, we may end up with a problem if we don't help the rest of the body. So the ways to help the whole body, that's called systemic treatment, are medications. So pills are intravenous. So we're gonna talk about this and split it up a little bit by the stage. So for patients who have early stage cancer, stage one and two, what we call early stage, we typically start with surgery. We do some, an operation to get rid of the cancer, perhaps some lymph nodes, because that helps us really define what the exact stage is. And then we make other decisions regarding further treatment related to what the final pathology report from surgery shows, combined with those cell prognostic factors. For patients who show up and have stage three, meaning a large cancer in the breast, definite positive lymph nodes, we call these patients locally advanced. So for some of these people, a lot of these people in this day and age, we start treatment by treating the whole body. Because by treating the whole body with medication, we're not only treating the cancer area in the breast and lymph nodes, but we're also going after cells that might have escaped from here and be circulating in our body. Even though we can't see them on a scan, we may have circulating cells. So systemic treatment can help with that. Additionally, one of the benefits is if somebody has a large tumor in the breast, if we give them whole body systemic treatment first, that tumor may shrink. We're gonna talk about surgery in a moment, but we may turn a situation around where the cancer was so large, the woman needed her whole breast removed to a situation where we can remove just the cancer and save the tumor. Women who, when we diagnose them, are found to have stage four disease are the biggest problem. So stage four means we can see actual evidence of the cancer in remote organs, such as the liver or the lungs or the bones. This disease in this day and age is not, or breast cancer is not considered curable. We can treat these patients and we can treat them very successfully 
for many, many years. So the treatment has to be systemic for these people because we're not just gonna do surgery and radiation here, that's not the problem. The problem is these cells have spread to vital organs, so we treat the whole body. And for those folks, we usually only treat the breast surgically if the overall systemic treatment is not helping control that local cancer. Meaning if we're giving chemotherapy, let's say, but they still have a large mass in the breast that's causing some problems. All right, so let's talk about the different types of treatment. So um, surgery, we're gonna talk about, then a bit about radiation and then whole body treatments. So the two main options with variations and subthemes is, are partial versus total mastectomy. So ectomy is Latin for removal of, think appendectomy, tonsillectomy. So the word mastectomy means to remove the breast. And we divide that into removing the whole breast or just a part of the breast. So removing the whole breast, so there are different terminologies you can use, but total or simple mastectomy means that we remove the whole breast. So who do we do that for? Typically we're doing that because of one of the following reasons. The tumor size is large enough that by the time we were to remove just the tumor, we don't have a breast, as I say, worth saving. Now that may vary from one person to the other, but based on the size of the tumor and the size of the breast, sometimes that's a problem. Some women are unfortunate enough to show up where they have multiple sites of cancer within the breast at the same time, they are best treated with removing the whole breast. If a woman is found to have a genetic mutation, meaning they inherited from mom or dad, a high risk of breast cancer, they may choose to have both breasts removed. Because although we could treat the cancer we have that day with the partial, they're at a much higher risk for getting another breast cancer. So they may choose both breasts off. Some patients choose just to have their breast off because that's their choice. They don't wanna to have to worry about future breast cancers and more mammograms and biopsies. And then I, again, it's a whole other discussion, but we offer breast reconstruction to pretty much everybody who has their whole breast removed unless there are medical reasons not to do it. And that's typically done at the same time as the mastectomy. So that's a total or simple mastectomy. For the majority of women who show up who have cancers found by mammograms, they're small, there's only one, and we can treat them, cure them, and save the breast. So partial mastectomy literally means to remove a part of the breast containing cancer. The cancer has to be removed with enough tissue around it that the edges of what we take out are free of cancer cells. Those are called the margins. Um, there's a term that's been around for a couple of decades now called lumpectomy. Uh, it literally means removal of a lump. And the problem that I have and a lot of folks have with that term is it's been used for cancers, but it's also been used for benign breast problems over the years. So when we use it or we put it on a record, then everybody scratches their heads and they say, oh, did that woman have cancer or she just had a non-cancerous lump that was removed? So in the cancer world, we like to use the term partial mastectomy because then it is understood that means it was a breast cancer operation. What about lymph nodes? They need to be evaluated as part of the stage. Removing them may also help. I put question marks because data on this is a little all over. It's unclear whether removing them actually increases survival, but definitely at the very least, we need to know whether the cancer has spread. So if somebody comes in and their lymph nodes are obviously abnormal, meaning if they've got a golf ball in their armpit, we just do a needle biopsy and then we know what we're dealing with. But if so, so if this person comes in, golf ball, put a needle in, find cancer. When we go to surgery, we remove a whole group of lymph nodes from the armpit. That procedure has been around for many decades. It's called an axillary node dissection. We take out a wad of fatty tissue and then the lab tells us how many nodes were in that wad and how many had cancer. For the majority of people nowadays diagnosed with imaging mammogram, they come in and their lymph nodes appear to be clean based on our exam and our imaging. So we need to know, are there any microscopic cancer cells within the nodes? And the procedure to figure that out is called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So instead of removing the whole bunch of nodes, we want to zero in and just remove a few nodes. So what we do is the following. On the day of the procedure, the surgeon injects into the breast, liquid tracers. This can be a radioactive tracer, very low dose radioactivity, or a colored tracer, blue dye, is injected into the breast. And over the next hour, while we're getting that person into surgery, that tracer gets into the lymph vessels, travels up to the armpit, and the tracer will get trapped in the main lymph nodes that all the lymph vessels from the breast are going to. 
if the cancer has spread, those are the nodes that the cancer cells would have gone to. So what we do is we do the injection in the pre-op area, <coughs> excuse me, and in surgery, we go into the armpit and we look for these nodes. We look for the blue dye by site and we look for the radioactive dye with a tracer. If those nodes, we remove them, they go to the lab, they get examined microscopically. If they do not contain cancer, we do not remove any mother nodes. And if they do, some people need more nodes removed, some don't. Again, that's another lengthy discussion we don't have time for tonight, but for the majority of women, nowadays we just remove one or two nodes and we know what our stage is. What about radiation? We talked about local treatment. Local treatment, we said surgery, radiation. Radiation is x-ray treatment just to that area. So radiation is used basically in two ways. It's used in addition to surgery or for people who have spread to other organs. Number one, in addition to surgery, it's used to lower the chance of another cancer in that breast if somebody has a partial. So if we do a partial, we typically add radiation. You can admit it for patients who are older, and I put older in quotations because that changes all the time. Um, but in general, partial mastectomy, we add radiation to lower the chance of more cancer in the breast. If somebody has the full breast removed, some women will still need radiation based upon how much cancer was found. In particular, if somebody has the full breast removed, if they have a lot of cancer in the lymph nodes, they still need radiation. And then if the second way to use radiation is for those patients who have stage four metastatic spread to other parts of the body, we may use it to help keep that cancerous area under control, for instance, if it's in a bone. So the most commonly used radiation is called external beam. This is the radiation room. You lie on the table, you get zapped. It's pretty simple and straightforward. There are other techniques. Again, that's another half an hour discussion, but external beam worldwide is reliable, commonly used, good cancer control and good cosmetic effect. We do a lot of things in this day and age with radiation to protect nearby structures. So that will be lungs, ribs, and on the left side, the heart. So there are specified, Specialized techniques to protect the heart. Deep inspiration breath hold is used when appropriate for left-sided breast cancers to protect the heart. So what about systemic therapy? So local treatment, surgery, radiation. Systemic therapy, pills, intravenous, medications, is used in a couple of reasons. It's used if we know for sure that there are cancerous cells that have spread outside the local area, meaning metastases if it's in our liver, if it's in our lungs, if it's in our nodes. The other people who may get systemic therapy are people who have poor prognostic factors. So remember we talked about what is the size, what do the nodes look like, but how aggressive are the cells? So there are some women who have small cancers, lymph nodes are clean, but we still recommend the whole body get treated. Why? Because they have aggressive cancer cells in terms of those hormone receptors, the HER2 nu and such, and we know that even if a few cells escape from the area and are circulating, that woman's body might have a harder time controlling them. So larger tumors, more nodes, poor prognostic factors, those are the people who need to really think about whole body treatment. And of course, we always take into account the age of the patient and all of their medical conditions. What are the different types of systemic therapy? Cytotoxic chemo, that's the one nobody wants to hear about. Chemotherapy is intravenous medication that kills cells that grow quickly. Cancer, abnormal cell growth, they're growing quickly. We can use cytotoxic chemotherapy on any breast cancer we want, and there are different types of chemo based upon stage, prognostic factor, and age. What about targeted treatments? That's very popular nowadays to talk about. So targeted treatments, number one for breast cancer to talk about right now, is intravenous medication that goes to cells that have that HER2, that HER2 new prognostic factor, not really a good one to have, but if you have it, we have monoclonal antibody therapies that we can use. And I put the name of the two there. There's the generic name and then the trade name next to it. What about other targeted therapies? Endocrine therapy. Most breast cancers have those estrogen receptors. So we have a variety of oral medications, pills, not chemo, pills that block estrogen receptors or somehow change that dynamic of estrogen locking into those cells. So for the majority of women who have estrogen receptor positive cancer, we can offer them pills to help go around the body and look for a starve off cancer cells that might be circulating. 
a quick slide about immunotherapy. Immunotherapy, again, it's a whole other lecture sometime, but immunotherapy is used for cancers nowadays. It's sort of in its toddlerhood, I would say, to harness that person's own immune system to help it go after the cancer cell. So for breast cancer right now, there are no immune therapies that are used as first line therapy for the majority of patients but there are some that are being researched. And I put here one of them is, that now is a first line just for unresectable, meaning enough cancer, they're not having surgery, locally advanced or spread elsewhere. These patients have to be triple negative. That's no hormone receptors, no HER2 new, and one other marker called PDL1 needs to be positive. So there is movement in the breast cancer world and all other cancers towards immunotherapy. But right now, immunotherapy is not first line treatment for the vast majority of breast cancer. So in closing here, going to Q&A, um, can breast cancer be cured? Yes. And I put that there because it was sort of surprising to me um, in my career that people came in my office, even people who had some healthcare contact, people who have worked in the healthcare system and were surprised when I said, yes, we can cure breast cancer. Yes, we can definitely cure breast cancer. I showed you the data. We cure the majority of women we see with breast cancer. But the earlier we catch it, the better chance it can be cured. So earlier catching it really means not just doing breast exams, but really critically getting breast imaging, mammograms, adding ultrasounds if people have dense tissue, and then adding breast MRI for those women who are deemed to be high risk, and high risk is decided by a provider reviewing family history, GYN history in terms of, remember we said the estrogen window, um, all of these factors come into looking at the risk. So the earlier it's caught, the better chance that we can cure the breast cancer. And the earlier it's caught, the less treatment that people need. So that's the other plug to get people to go for their imaging, find their cancers earlier, because when we find them, they're smaller, we need less likely that we will need things such as chemotherapy. And I think that's it. Yay, silence. <laughs> okay. Hi everyone, can you hear me on your end? I can hear you on my laptop, but I don't think it's coming across anywhere other than the laptop. Okay. That's fine. Can the people in the audience hear Sally? That's what we need to know. They're raising their hands, yes. Yes, okay. So the first question um, is, could you please describe and explain what breast crystals are? Um, the answer to that, I'm gonna take this off since I'm alone again. The answer to that is no, because that's not an actual medical thing. So if somebody so has used that term to describe something to someone, that is not a commonly used term. So the answer is I don't know what that person's talking about. Not because I don't know, but because that's not a term. They might be, maybe somebody meant calcifications. Calcifications are little deposits of calcium. They're seen on mammography. The vast majority are not related to cancer, but a small percentage are. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, could you please define the estrogen window? So the estrogen window is age at your first period, how much estrogen is in the body. So age at your first period, age at your last period, were you on postmenopausal hormone therapy? What age were you when you first had a child? And that helps to define for the body how risky it is. And there's no, you know, not any one of these things is an immediate deal breaker, like above or below this age. These are actually all factors that are put into computer programs that will then calculate the risk. So we go to a computer program, we put age at first period, age at last period, age at first child, but the estrogen window is basically how much estrogen the breasts are being exposed to. Okay. Our next question is, uh, one of our participants was reading about dye-infused pills that travel through the bloodstream and light up tumors. Is this a real thing in testing? At this time, no. Okay. So it might be experimental and being researched, but no, this is not standard. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, has Middlesex Health considered same-day mammogram readings? 
Yes, that's a short answer. Yes, and we've tried doing, the, the problems with that actually have to do with coordination of care. Because when a woman goes for her mammogram, we never know exactly how long that's going to take. They might need an ultrasound, they might need more pictures, the doctor may need to call them back. So one of the barriers to doing that, if you're a high volume center, which we are because we're trying to make certain that we have access to care for everybody, is that we would need to set aside large windows of time for people. So if somebody gets stuck in mammography for an extra 30 minutes, how do they get to their doctor's office that same day? And then how does that interrupt the care for all the other patients who are coming in at the same time? So the answer is we've tried. It's very difficult to do. Most places that are high volume centers do not do that routinely. Uh, if people have a special reason to do it, we absolutely will work with them. We have some patients who come long distances, and so we can certainly accommodate those folks. Great, thank you. Our next question is, does breast tissue density change as we age? So the answer to that is yes. It may be, it's not very dramatic. We don't go from one extreme to the other, but I always say look at a 20-year-old's breast and look at a 90-year-old's breast. They're different levels of density. They also change as a result of our body mass index because there's a lot of fat in the breast. So when there's more fat, not that it's necessarily good for you, but it does sort of separate out the rest of the breast tissue a bit. It changes related to hormones and how premenopausal, postmenopausal, post postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy. And the other thing I say what confuses patients a lot is breast density is not a number. It's not as if you did a blood count, put it in a machine and came up with a number. There are four categories of breast density, and it's very subjective. Breast density is determined by the radiologist looking at the mammogram. And if you've ever looked at a mammogram, it's all gray and white and black shades together. And what the radiologist reading it has to say is, what percent of what I'm looking at with my eyes, what percent is white versus black on this grayness? And so if it's under 25% versus 25 to 50, 50 to 75 or over 75 percent, they put you in a category. So you can see how it's vague where somebody might, they're not going to change from the furthest categories year to year, but sometimes people bounce around in two adjacent categories based upon who's reading their mammogram and a variety of other hormonal things. And our next question is, how important is it to remain on estrogen blockers if you were and forgive me if I get this acronym wrong, HER2 positive, and for how long? So HER2 positive and estrogen receptors are a little bit separate. So what we know about HER2 positivity, those cancers are a bit more aggressive. But if that woman has HER2 directed treatment, so intravenous monoclonal antibodies, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, if that woman has those treatments for her HER2 breast cancer, her risk level after that becomes the same as if she never had the HER2. So now she's back in the regular category of the estrogen receptor positive person. So for somebody who has positive estrogen receptors, the, it, it's always hard to say without knowing the individual case, right? Because if somebody has stage three estrogen receptor positive versus stage one, their risk of recurrence is going to be different. So when you weigh the risks and the benefits of taking those medications, you need to say, okay, the risk is, well, the drugs have side effects and possible complications. The benefit is going to vary based upon the exact stage that the person was. So that's a conversation everybody with breast cancer has to have with their oncologist. What are the risks? What are the benefits for me personally based upon my cancer as well as the rest of my health? Great, thank you. That currently are, is all the questions that we have at the moment. Great. Uh, Sarah, come over. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sally. That worked out well. <laughs> My pleasure. All righty. So um, we just have a few final um, uh, slides to go over with you. Um, and, excuse me. Um, and we definitely want your feedback. This is our third um, health talk for 2020. We had to change our format dramatically, um, as you all understand, and we really want to know um, how tonight worked. So please um, visit this link to fill out the survey, middlesexhealth.org 
forward slash women's fund survey, and we will be emailing that to you as well. Um, if any more questions come in, we can certainly get to those. Um, and um, going forward, um, I just want to thank again all of our members for supporting the Women's Wellness Fund and our sponsors. Um, if you are interested in becoming a member, we welcome you. Um, membership starts at $100 per year. It includes an invitation to three health talks like this. Um, when we are able to gather in person, it also would include a meal um, and time to socialize. 100% um, of what you give is directed toward uh, one of the priority projects that we're funding in any given year, and you can choose them or you can choose to fund all of them. Um, Again, uh, if you want to join, you can visit our website and learn more. It's middlesexhealth.org forward slash women's wellness fund. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, my information is here, my phone number and my email. Um, and I'm uh, happy uh, to, to answer any questions you have. The, the chat that we're getting is excellent presentations. Thank you, Dr. Maylon. Thank you to Dr. Maylon from a grateful patient. So thank you so much for sharing that. We'll make sure if there's any other comments that we share that with Dr. Maylon. Um, again, thank you again for joining us. Um, it's October 28th. We're closing out uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I heard from our mammographers that Breast Cancer Awareness Month really does help. And perhaps Dr. Maylon can confirm that, that the number of um, mammograms goes up in October. Um, and we do somewhere around 23,000 mammograms every year. Right. The, if you couldn't hear Dr. Malon in the room, um, what she said is we did have to shut down regular screening mammogram during COVID. Um, because of the volume that we have here. So we are trying to play catch up, adding hours so that we can make sure we have all women get their screening this year when they're due for it. Um, so again, if there's any questions related to mammography, we can also help direct you in the right direction. Um, so the general number for our office is 860-358-6200. And I'm gonna um, sign off and thank all of you so much for participating tonight.